Am I miscuing here or are we on already? Okay, welcome back to the second part of session five of our unfinished revolution discussion. So uh, we had a very good part, early part of this, and the experiment about getting more interaction is very rewarding for me. I liked it. <coughs> so in the second one, we're going to pick up again about the OHS and focus for a while specifically on the open source approach with that. And um, so I'll give you some introduction and we'll get some speakers going. That um, the, the Kodiak, which we remember is concurrent development, integration, and of application of knowledge. It was just sort of the best summary, sort of an acronym fashionable thing we could get to say, these are the basic capabilities you're going to have to in cultivate in order to get better at this collective IQ stuff. And so the o open hyper document system we hypothesized is something that whatever the name is, has to e grow and evolve in the world where it's uh, it's no matter where you jump to with your links, it's on a style that your browser knows how to deal with. And it may have different grades of capability that you can click up to with different kinds of interfaces, but you have to have the basic sign of thing that your knowledge packages convey their knowledge in some standard ways that, and it, that having structure in them, because a lot of our knowledge really is structured, and turns out it helps and then having optional views helps you look at it in ways that for your particular need of the moment help you derive what you need to know from looking at that knowledge container. <clears throat> and we've known, that we've known by things that have been experimented with in the past, there are lots of very interesting things that people have done that aren't yet integrated out in the world. So they have to be integrated and we know about that. So we hypothesize that <clears throat> and it's a mixture of dealing with the content specification and the way the properties are encoded, et cetera, within the knowledge container, having that be standard, and at the same time, there's going to be a rapid evolution, hopefully, in what kind of properties or stuff we find are really useful in there, and that those get encoded in a standard way. And then the standard kind of operations you want to do in them need to be something if you're going to share and share views, et cetera, with people but also the option for having wide ranges of capabilities still able to go in there with appropriate interface setups with a lot more variety to it than today in order for that and something that lets really high performance people move on ahead and function with a lot more capability inside the knowledge domains that they'll be sharing with other people. So we've talked about all these things sort of in the past. So this open hyper document system needs to evolve in order to fulfill the need for that kind of open, standard, global sort of way in which your knowledge containers are and the functionality for operating on them is. So <clears throat> the emergence a year and a half or more ago of more and more awareness about the open source movement was just a very important sort of move for us to look at to say something like that would be the only way I could conceive that the evolution of the sort of thing we've been t we talk about in this open hyper document system, the only way that evolution can really happen in such a widespread way in which concurrently you're going to have to be evolving in many given knowledge domains, but still in the way that you can interoperate between them, etc. And also between different languages and things like that. So anyway, and going after that, the need in trying to do this, so it's a sort of dynamic way in which we're talking about, you need to have participatory communities that are actively involved with using and improving both the Kodiak and the OHS. In order for having the evolution of the OHS sort of be in harmony with the evolution of the Kodiak capabilities themselves, you just have to have relative communities out there that are focused on improving the different aspects of it in cooperation like that. And then the functionality of that is something that really the open source mode just seems perfect for that. So what we need from that is an initial framework for this hyper document architecture. 
an initial framework for the functional tool systems and also a framework for dealing with intellectual property on that. And we need a basic organizational framework for that evolution that you just can't turn it loose out there. That every open source mode itself has got some place that releases, you know, different new versions. And some place there has to be some decision process that say, okay, that's version 17. Oh, we might have three versions, 17A, B, and C or something. But in order to keep from having just random and staffing, you have to have some kind of process, whatever you call it, governance or coordination or something that is sort of dealing with that. Well, that's similar to the process by which standards are set today, that you have to have a community of people involved with setting the standards for many of these things. So that has to happen. Well, those communities are all subject to being able to be improved in their capability by adding to their Kodiak. So we talked before the break about what, what kinds of social organisms would pay off the best to get started. Oh boy, if you got the kind of evolutionary communities that are involved with this stuff, Early, early on, be involved, you see. They are, the experience they'd get would help guide them a great deal in what sort of things are necessary to do to build in the Kodiak and the OHS. So he says, great. So there may be some of those communities or committees out there that are so embedded in the old way of doing things and their old representatives that they might not want to move, but it would be a real feather in the bootstrapping cap to be able to make a value proposition to those kinds of communities that they get involved in the evolution of the OHS Kodiak too. So that because they're getting more effective at their doing their collective work would just be a boost for it all. So I use the word governance in there and we need to talk about it right up in the open. It's sort of like saying there's no way any collective activity can go, go ahead and get very complicated without some process by which they decide which direction they're going to go collectively and how they spend their collective resources on this pursuit and what kind of standards they set up, etc. So that's a real process. It's not unlike any other sort of governance process we see in society today. Well, governance processes themselves are capabilities which are just marvelous ones that need improving. And so, great, let's start talking about that. And uh, I won't even embarrass California by saying, how far would you have to mature in some of these prototypical communities before you could reach out to a state and say, which state's going to get smarter firster? <laughs> smarter first. Smart firster. <laughs> and then you can start ringing the doorbell in different countries and say, hey, you know, why don't we start examining the improvement infrastructure that can be nationwide and say, which countries are going to really go about it? So that's why we brought Japan over here, is to embarrass some of the other countries that might be tuning in on this services. Then you'd say, where in the country would you push the doorbell to say, hey, wake up country, why don't you start getting serious about your improvement infrastructure and then help finding the ways you can improve your improvement process, etc. So anyway, so we'll go from that back down a few levels to the open hybrid argument system and consider some of the things about it that um, the intellectual property that would start being generated is something that needs care, care and feeding. And so these questions have come up off and on through the years and said, well, there are the options to make it totally open or totally what? And so that's, that's the kind of thing that, that we'll get a very good treatment about here. So we have to sort of learn more about it and then make our choice. And for the best chance that OHS and Kodiak can evolve to the scale, the capability, and the pervasiveness that's required for the challenge of ac adequately boosting mankind's collective IQ. So, you know, think big, huh? <laughs> well, you think big enough and you find it just crunching to the ground. Well, uh, I, think, I think it's worth really thinking about, so that's what we're getting to do. So, we're now introducing Christine Peterson, Executive Director of Foresight Institute in Los Altos, and I've known her now for a decade, and uh, I get more impressed all the time. And her husband is Eric Drexler, who's done so much to get nanotechnology launched. And I often think about, if it weren't for Christine, I wonder how big an impression her husband could have made on this, because she's very effective. So she'll tell you about more of the capability things that she's uh, involved with. Christine.
Thanks, Doug. Uh, <clears throat> Before I get started, uh, I'm going to be talking about open source. I should mention I'm not the world's expert on open source, and I know there are many of you in the audience today who are quite knowledgeable on open source. So if I say anything that needs correction, please jump right in. Don't wait. Uh, we don't want to confuse anybody in the audience. Uh, but before I get started, um, how many of you here today already are, are fairly familiar with the concept of open source? <laughs> and how many of you already feel that the open hyperdocument system really needs to be open source? Okay. Um, I guess I'm done and I'll just sit down now. <laughs> Uh, for those of you out in, the, uh, out in the electronic audience, we had a very high show of hands on both those questions. Uh, and I'm not surprised. Um, uh, the open source community, for, for those of you who may not be familiar with it, I think is the best example of a networked improvement community that I can think of. Um, it's, uh, it's really remarkably well organized, uh, considering that the organization comes from the bottom up. In other words, there is no top-down organization, there's no governmental or corporate structures that make the open source community work. The definition of open source, uh, that's, that's uh, on the web and I'll refer you to it at opensource.org. Uh, there's more to it than just that the uh, source code of software needs to be available. Uh, in, in addition, there are other requirements, uh, free re redistribution, uh, without royalties, you have to be able to allow changes to the code and no discrimination, for example. Uh, it might be tempting to say, well, um, we want our software to be completely open source and available to everyone except for people at this one company. Now, I won't give any names of a particular <laughs> company. Uh, you make up your own company, but uh, the fact is you can't do that. Um, it's either open source to everyone or it's not open source to anyone. and. Uh, that's why Sun, which has a real issue with one particular company, uh, can't, doesn't feel comfortable with the open source model. They have come up with their own model, uh, which, which we should cover. I think it's an interesting model. Um, examples of uh, open source software um, include Linux, of course, the operating system. Uh, but more, even more interesting than Linux, I think, is Apache, the uh, web server, which is extremely successful in the marketplace. Uh, and I believe is still gaining market share. I think they have the highest market share and are still gaining market share uh, against uh, Microsoft, for example. And the open source model is starting to catch on uh, among many uh, of the companies. In fact, you know, Apple's going partly open source with their new operating system. Um, HP is doing some open source stuff. Of course, SGI has gone totally over to the open source model uh, as in an attempt to, to come roaring back as they used to be. Um, the only one who's really not play well, Microsoft is not playing. Uh, the only one who's, uh, that you might expect to play who is not playing is Sun. Um, they have gone for a different model. They are going for the Sun community license. Uh, and the reason for that is that Sun gets to keep uh, ultimate control of the code that way. And they, they feel strongly and sincerely that this is the way to go and this will benefit everyone. Um, it's an experiment that I think we should have some sympathy with. I don't think we can say we've explored license space thoroughly for software. It's early days yet. So I think if Bill Joy wants to do some experimentation, I, th I think surely he's earned the right to do that, given what he's given to the community. So what is required to have this process work? Um, it's been said by the uh, fellow who did, I believe, Tickle, John Osterhout, isn't that right? Yes, thank you. I knew you were a knowledgeable audience. Uh, that it takes about 5,000 users to get a really healthy open source uh, effort going. That's users, not developers. In other words, the pressure from 5,000 users is enough to get uh, a robust process working. So that will be our goal, I feel. That will be my goal for the open hyperdocument system, is to get this, get whatever we come up with good enough so that there are 5,000 people using it in a real way and then we'll have something that will successfully bootstrap, continue to bootstrap. We will, be, we help, we will have succeeded, I feel, if we can get that far. Um, I should mention that open source software is not a new idea at all. Um, you know, the previous term was free software and even before the term free software, 
uh, original software is all open source. It was traditional for software to be open source from the beginning. So uh, it's not as though we've, there's been no invention of a new, uh, of an of a extremely new theory of software. Uh, we've, in a way, we've gone back to the roots of, of what worked in the early days when the internet was originally developed. Um, uh, the reason that the name changed from free software, which is still a viable name, and we use that sometimes when we want to specify that specific subset, uh, the, the reason it changed from free software to open source is primarily because it was very hard to get companies to pay for free software. Uh, in fact, you couldn't even get them to listen to free software or anything about it. They'd, they'd hear it, they'd think shareware, they would be extremely confused. Uh, it was necessary to come up with a little marketing spin, and so that's what was done. Uh, so it's not like there was a split in the movement or anything like that. Uh, it was just a marketing move. So why is open source the way to go here? Uh, one of my favorite reasons is that it cannot be killed. Uh, those of you who write code, uh, if you've ever written code for a company, uh, you know that the company owns the code, and uh, if they want to use it for something, they use it for something, and if they don't, they lock it up in a closet and it disappears forever. You can't do anything with it. Nobody can do anything with it. Um, and given the way uh, the IP laws work, you're not even supposed to use the ideas. Those ideas may belong to your employer now. It's very hard to do those kind of divisions of your brain so that, oh, I did that at IBM in 19, 1989, and I did this at HP in 1990. That's not how the human brain works. So, that, so uh, this, this doesn't work very well in reality. And when you think of the amount of intellectual property that's locked up in closets now, and I love Xerox PARC, but let's take them as an example. Um, how much software developed by Xerox PARC uh, is just sort of sitting around doing nothing? And the answer is, I think, a huge amount, a huge amount, and for no reason. Um, what would make sense for, I, you know, maybe I'm wrong, but what I think would make sense would be if in fact a company, any company, uh, has software that they're not going to do anything with. The, the reasonable thing to do, both for their own benefit and for the benefit of their employees, is to open source it. Uh, it, it helps the company's reputation. Another way it helps is by uh, helping reduce the chance that some other company is gonna patent the technology that this company has already, has already come up with. If you have it in the closet, nobody can tell that you had it earlier. The prior art is not out there. Um, and you know the way the patent system is going now, anybody can patent anything, whether it's new or not. It happens all the time. So if you want to protect yourself and make sure your company will always have access to that technology, you're not using it in a commercial product, open source it. Get it out there. Your programmers will love that. It'll be a great recruiting tool if you can tell them, look, if we're not going to commercialize it, it'll be open sourced. This helps the programmer's reputation. And that's what motivates these, the, the very best programmers. They, money, yeah, they can get money. They get lots of money. But these people are artists. They love their work. They want to share their work with other people across company lines. How can you enable that? Well, uh, at the very least, you can tell them, look, if we don't use it, uh, we'll open source it. Uh, how, do you motivate these, how do you motivate people outside your company to help you with uh, your open source project? Um, there's the reputation value. But you'd think, well, you know, let's say you've got a, a company, Red Hat. Let's take Red Hat. Um, how do you motivate people outside Red Hat to help Red Hat with their, with their software? Well, um, you may recall when Red Hat uh, IPO'd, they used the friends and family, so the friends and family uh, stock offer to reward uh, key people who had helped them. So in a for-profit environment, it is possible to give not just reputation value, which, they value, which the programmers value a lot, but actual cash, which is always nice, and is, a sim is a symbolic of, of acknowledging their contribution, which they also like. Um, why am I focusing on the commercial side? Um, the reason is that you can do a great open source project, but unless you, it's eventually commercialized, you don't have the marketing dollars to get the attention of people out in the world to get them to use this thing. Um, you can have fantastic software, but think of the volume of information that comes at you every day about new web things. I mean, it's totally overwhelming. Uh, you have to fight it off. 
So how can you ever find out about good open source software? Um, somebody has to have some dollars to get the, get the news out to you. So uh, another, advan ad ad uh, another advantage of doing things in an open source way that I don't hear mentioned very often, and I think it's because companies don't really like to play this up, is that um, by making your product open source, you can pull help in from other companies, um, regardless of whether the uh, other companies want to or not. Um, the license of the, of the code is set. It cannot be changed. It can't be stolen. So if you're you, whether your, your employees can work on the code if they want to, which they're going to do whether you like it or not, uh, and the project is benefited no matter where these, where these employees go. And given the way they circulate so quickly now, you, ha you, you, can't, you can't do a project where every two years or six months you lose, lose all the information in a human being's brain. You've got to have access to that. So for the project, if not for the, comp the employers, it's a big payoff to have access to, continuing access to that uh, expertise. I mentioned that open source projects, I believe, get the best architects and programmers. Um, I, I think there's no question about that. Um, you'd have to, because they're getting reputation value of payments, uh, you'd have to pay them a lot more in cash to get them to give you their intellectual property, especially with the knowledge that you may lock it in a closet and their reputation may never benefit from this. It's as though, maybe, that a lot of you have probably, um, I know some of you here in the audience have written books. If you've read a book contract, the way it reads is, if the book goes out of print, the rights revert to the author, right? Doesn't that make sense? If the company who owns this thing is no longer interested in it, do they get to just lock it in a closet? No, it reverts to the author. And uh, you can see why that would make some sense with software as well. That's, in essence, what uh, open source ensures, that the creator of this work uh, will never lose access to at least the reputation value. Uh, he or she may lose everything else, but the reputation value will stay. Open source seems to be more likely to follow existing standards out in the world. Um, you remember when there was the big Netscape Microsoft battle on the browser technology, and they, the, the goal there was not to support existing standards. It was to uh, do great new features uh, regardless of what the standards were. Part of the reason for that is the standards organization was too slow. And I think that's why the, mo the whole model of how do you establish standards in software is changing. I think instead of having a bunch of people sitting around uh, a table or online debating, making theoretical academic arguments, instead it will be uh, an open source process where the way you establish a standard is by writing great code and showing, saying, all right, this is good, and proving it that way. Uh, if only all standards could be done that way, it would be great. Um, so I think for that reason, open source efforts tend to be much more likely to become standards. They're, they're in conformance with existing standards, and they move faster. I think open source projects move faster. Uh, they just they have access to many more minds. Um, the openness is, is, uh, is critical to having lots of input from people uh, whose employers may not even approve of this. One common advantage um, of open source is said to be fewer bugs. Uh, that's pretty, uh, that's pr kind of an obvious thing. If you think about a large software uh, program, think about, for example, Windows 2000. I've heard that that has 50,000 lines of code. Now, I was, 50 million. 50 million, thank you, thank you. See, I knew I would need you guys' help sometime. <laughs> when, I, when, when that number was announced at the first open source developers day, they were all programmers in the audience and it was this, someone said 50 million lines of code and they went, Ah, there's a gasp, of, they were appalled by this number, just the sheer magnitude of that complexity. And how could you get that to work? Well, um, <laughs> we'll see, I don't know. Maybe it'll work great, I don't know. But um, the question is, you think about that much code and you say, all right, how many people have actually looked at each piece of that code? How many, you know, the one person who wrote it, okay, that's one. Anybody else? I don't know. Um, at least with open source, there's a chance that the code has been reviewed by multiple people. It, it makes it possible that things going to work. 
Uh, now, there's a question of, sp of speed of development. It's important to realize you have a greater speed of development for a given level of quality. Now, there's been fussing about the speed of development in Linux. Well, uh, that's because the technologists are in charge. The marketing people are not in charge. And so the technologists are going to wait until they're ready. And until then, it's just going to wait. Uh, there's no one saying we have to release this uh, on, you know, March 1st because there's this trade show. That's not how it works. So there's no one saying, well, we're, gonna, we're going to make up 10 new dumb features to put on the outside of the box so we have something to write in a press release so that somebody will upgrade to this, this, new, uh, this new version. It just doesn't happen. For our open hyperdocument system, perhaps one of the most important advantages is that, in theory at least, it can, we can attract diverse funding sources to the same project across uh, company boundaries. Um, Doug, is, Doug likes to talk about government. I don't like to talk about government. I would never go to government for this, but okay, we can disagree on that. Um, one thing I think we can agree on is that, uh, how many of you have heard about this Red Hat Center for Open Source? Not so, not so many. There's a reason for that, which is um, it was announced in November. They say they're going to have eight million dollars to promote the open source concept, even beyond even beyond the software development borders. In other words, you can take the, the, the open source theory and say, well, what if you applied it to politics, Bus you know, business, the open management kind of thing? It's kind of like open source in business. Uh, so that's eight million dollars that I think that the Open Hyperdocument System Project might want to uh, might want to ask for. They haven't been doing a lot of uh, advertising of this yet. I don't think it's really set up. But Mark Ewing, anybody here know Mark Ewing of Red Hat personally? Personally, okay, he's the man. We have to get to get to, to Mark Ewing. Uh, he's going to be running it. Now, in terms of the selection of the open source license, assuming we do decide to go open source with this, it's not my area of expertise. Um, it's a complicated issue. Um, the actual licenses themselves are pretty straightforward, but the question is what kind of social results come out of it. Um, people will argue that the GNU public license um, leads to less forking of the code. That's, that's a possibility. Um, the Berkeley license, um, which we use for our CRIT project, uh, allows more flexibility in what happens with uh, what happens with the stuff after you release it. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? We'll be debating that. It's not really my area. Uh, about spreading the open source concept to other areas, I think we have to say we're doing that. This this project that that Doug is proposing is not just a software project. It's beyond that. So we we want to take these concepts and push them. Uh, in addition to uh, the Red Hat Center for Open Source, um, another organization that tries to do that is Foresight Institute, my organization. Uh, we'll be having a meeting May 19 through 21 where we will do some of this. It'll be in Palo Alto. Uh, if you want to go to that meeting or are interested in details, don't wait because uh, last year this meeting sold out about three months early and it was very difficult to get in. So if you're interested, uh, Come and give your email address either to me or to Tanya. Wave your hands, Tanya. Thank you. Uh, and we'll get you that invitation. What is it again for? I mean, what is it for? Explain again what the meeting is about. What's the meeting? Of, that's hard. Okay. Doug wants me to explain what the meeting is about. That's kind of hard. Um, Foresight looks at coming technologies, powerful technologies, such as nanotechnology, uh, and tries to look at ways to... Uh, maximize the benefits and reduce the risks associated with them. And I think there was a, a, a talk by Neil Jacobstein earlier in this, in this series that talked about some of the downsides and how to head them off in nanotechnology. That's the kind of thing we talk about and the open hyperdocument system is, is one of the tools that we are attempting to do. We did a very tiny piece called CRIT. I think Tanya Jones talked about that in an, earlier in this, uh, in this series. Uh, so uh, we are working on, on the, a lot of the same problems that Doug is. So that's May 19 through 21, and if you're interested, don't wait. Please come see me or Tanya. That's it. Um, I want to stay for a few questions? Yeah, are there any questions? Comments, corrections? Yeah, it's Shane. Uh, 
very mixed authorship. I'd like to hear your views on uh, liability. The question is about liability and uh, liability issues with open source software. Uh, well, this is, it's an interesting question and there's a couple ways to come at it. One is you can say, all right, who are you going to sue? Um, in the case of, say, Linux, uh, you could sue, if, if you don't like Linux, if, you don't li if there's a problem with Linux with you, for you, it doesn't work, it blows up your plant, whatever. You could sue Red Hat. If you got your software from Red Hat, you could sue Red Hat. Um, and I think that because it came out from Red Hat, I don't think the question of who wrote that individual line of code that caused the uh, disaster would come up. I think it's Red Hat that would be legally liable for that, uh, which means Red Hat better feel pretty comfortable and confident in the code. Um, a more serious problem, I think, is patent liability in software. Uh, and that has not been resolved. Um, I think the, the answer there is, is not to let it inhibit us on open source. The answer is to try to reform the software patent system itself. And actually that's one of Foresight's charters, one of our current missions, is to take that on. I know it's very difficult. We're up against some very large companies. On the other hand, we have some, we have some, pretty, good, uh, we have some pretty good tools we can use on this. So it's a very ambitious project to reform the patent system uh, for, soft, for software, but we're, we're going to take it on. Um, the, th the last point on liability is that we at Force have taken the attitude of, well, we're not, we're not going to let fears of liability inhibit us from doing what we know is right, <laughs> whatever it is. The thing is, these days there's so much liability, legal liability for everything. It's like you take a step, you could be sued for something, you know, who knows. Um, you can either let that intimidate you into doing nothing, or you can go on your way and do it anyway. Um, take eBay, for example. Um, eBay actually is, uh, has always been violating California laws about auctions. They were from the beginning. Uh, did they care? Did they even know? I don't know. <laughs> Does it, now they've got the money. Now that they've succeeded, they've got the money to deal with all that stuff. But if they had, if they had worried about it at the beginning, they might never have gotten to be where they are. So the whole liability thing is such a mess that I just refuse to let it paralyze me. Yes? When you started open source, I, one of, oh, when you started uh, discussing open source, it struck me that the ultimate open source for humanity is perhaps the Human Genome Project, and that reforming the patent system for software could very well uh, be springboarded from reforming the patent system over treating of human genes. I, I find it personally offensive. I think that a company could own rights to a gene in my body where they didn't even know it existed when I was born. So there is something morally offensive to me about the idea of patenting human or any other genetic material not generated in the laboratory. So it would seem to me that there's a lot of leverage in pursuing that route to challenge software patents as well. Yeah, I, I agree. That's, an, that's on our list, too. We're going to go after that one as well, because I think um, it's just ridiculous that they are permitting patents of natural genes found, right. found in nature. I mean, new genes, okay, we can talk about it. Natural genes, I'm sorry. You didn't invent that. You can talk about the Pope, to the Pope about prior art. <laughs> Beck? I understand that... Uh, in, at least in California, that uh, unincorporate, in unincorporated associations, every member of the, of the association is legally liable. And so I'm not an attorney, but I would prefer to see you know, anything that I join to be, say, a non-private corporation, just for, for that reason. Yeah. Um, in terms of, le of, of actually one reason that I can afford to be so cavalier about legal liability is that Foresight is a nonprofit corporation, and we have excellent directors and officers insurance that covers the volunteers as well. So if any of you want to do anything that's a little nervous making, come see me, and I'll refer you to my insurance agent, and you can be covered for this too. Non actually, the, the nonprofit corporation form is very useful for dealing with liability. Yes, sir. Can you talk more about the difference between the Sun Microsystems model and the open source model? 
Okay, yes. Um, the main difference between the Sun Microsystems model, called the Sun Community License, and the open source model is that Sun uh, wants, if I, and, and I may have this wrong, stop me if I have it wrong, but I believe Sun wants final say on uh, code that is being redistributed. In other words, if you want to take Java and go off in your, uh, in your, in your dorm room and change Java, you can do whatever you want with, to Java. Uh, if you want to take Java and, and start redistributing it commercially, uh, number one, I think Sun wants to see that code in advance and approve it. Uh, their concern is compa compatibility issues. Uh, and, and you can see why they have compatibility issues concerns. They just won a lawsuit against Microsoft for exactly this issue on Java. So they have issues here. Um, the other thing is, I think if you do it commercially and make money, you have to give them a royalty. So these, the, the main difference is that under the, under the open source model, uh, you really do relinquish control to the process. You trust the process. Under the Sun Community License model, you relinquish control to Sun and you trust Sun. Now, there are a lot of people in the world who feel more comfortable trusting Sun than they do the open source process. Uh, for example, I think Bill Joy believes that big companies uh, feel more comfortable interacting with another big company than they do, abandon, you know, as, as, as they might see it, abandoning themselves to this unknown, un not well understood process. I can understand that. He might be right. Um, I think for our purposes, uh, for open hyper document system, that's not an issue. Uh, but for for Ford, who knows what their their incentives are? Um, I've actually been working on Sun in terms of with Genie, which is another technology which actually pioneered the Scuzzle Sun Community Source License. And the basically what you're saying is right. Um, but the interoperability is, is, is a real key thing there, that the idea of the technology for Java, that your Java program would run everywhere, and some companies like Microsoft would do their extended embrace and change it so break it so you can't use it, you have to use theirs on their platform. So that's a major concern, and I think it would be a concern also for an open hypertext system, hyper document system, in that if you want to have multiple organizations being able to have their documents read by each other, um, they need to be interoperable. The other uh, difference I would say between the two is one um, that you actually brought up between yourself and Doug, which is the governance model. The classic model for a, a open source project is a hopefully benevolent dictator. Um, and you just trust that the person who hold the, held the original vision for the, the, the software um, is going to be the one making all the decisions, and you just sort of trust that's going to work out. And if it doesn't, then there's a forking of the code and sort of a revolution happens. The Sun model right now has been one of a community governance system where the community members do have a say. So it's not Sun controlling it. It's Sun saying, we want to make sure we've got a process here where change can happen, uh, even change Sun doesn't particularly care for. but change will happen inside the governance of the community so the whole thing will, will move as a whole. And that's a very real concern. Uh, the inter interoperability thing is a very real concern. As for whether we have to go to the Sun Community License model, um, I would point at, uh, I think the reason people think of that, the sort of the benevolent dictator model, uh, one reason is because of Linux and Linus Torvalds and that model. But I think the, uh, and again help me out here, but I think the Apache model is different. Among others, yeah. The Apache model is not a benevolent dictatorship. It is a group of, uh, of people who, who form a, um, a kind of um, uh, collective, if you will. And there are a number of other uh, significant open source projects that do not have a benevolent dictatorship model. So even though that is uh, certainly um, quite common, it's by no means the only uh, open source model. And, and it, I should mention it is... Uh, I'm going to wrap it up. I, I, <laughs> Doug says I'm going to wrap it up. Um, <laughs> benevolent dictator. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Pearl is another classic example as well. It's, I, I should mention that it's possible that the Sun, the Sun Community License model, given that they, you know, they're trying to develop the same kind of thing where you have a, a real community that is not totally Sun dominated, it's possible that, that as time goes by we may find that the way that operates isn't that different from the way the Apache model or the Perl model operates. That will be good if it happens, and we all we all hope so. And 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 I certainly think, as I said before, I think Bill Joy and Son deserve a chance to try out their model. Okay. Thank you.
you. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> I'm a great admirer of the young lady here. <clears throat> anyway, thank you. Um, there are a lot of questions that still are there, and uh, so we know that there are different models. And somehow, a dialogue about the different models and particulars about if we get serious about going ahead with the OHS and the rest of the Kodiak environment. Uh, which kind of model would best pursue that? And uh, uh, I don't, I don't feel comfortable with the benevolent dictator role exactly. But uh, how do I turn this thing back on? Um, we, uh, is there any button to push? To I kept wiggling, you know, I little. Figure the mouse. Yes, I. Prejudice about that. <laughs> right. Well, <clears throat> um, there, there, you know, I, I sit there and all kinds of things turn on my head, but I think it'd be better to go ahead with the uh, sort of schedule we have. <clears throat> and one thing I, some of the scheduled things are there to fit in, but I, I wonder if we have a little bit of unscheduled thing is Andrew back here is leaving for Australia and he was mentioning to me ahead of time that the uh, things about the Xanadu project where there were lots of resources put in for years about that and somehow it never wrapped up. But he's got some things to say because he's been a, a, a close partner in that world for a while. So do you want to just speak from using the microphone there? Is that okay? Um, yeah, I, I could do that. Um, I, I think it'd probably be better if I came up though because I'll have to hold the button okay. for a while otherwise. That's fine. Uh, <laughs> assuming it'll take him a little while to get here, that this model that I showed some time ago is something that, yeah. This 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 model that's that's here now is something that uh, it. It's an old one, but it embodies the conceptual thing that I think is so very important about getting ahead with what we want to have an open hyper document thing. And one of them is different classes of users. Another is different classes of devices out there that you're going to want to be able to operate from your cell phone or whatever else is out there like that. So you need this sort of virtual terminal sort of operator like that so that whatever you're doing gets put into that. You also need to have you, the user profile and whatever different language and interface that you're going to establish are and stuff like that. So it just uh, has built into it a lot of what the potential evolutionary potential is out there that we've got. So that's what I'd like to do. And so, uh, Andrew, tell them your name and address and what you want to say. Um, yeah, uh, I should just probably give a, um, uh, a brief. I'm Andrew Pan, but uh, my affiliation is a bit more complicated because I'm involved with a number of different things. For example, I've contributed a fair bit to Linux here and there recently. Um, and uh, I've been working pretty extensively with the Xanadu project since 94. Um, and prior to that was a beta tester. And I also work with my partner, Catherine, who's here today on a thing called Glass Wings, which is about creating media and publishing it on the net and preserving literature and so forth, which kind of overlaps with the Xanadu goals, except that Xanadu is more about enabling the tools, whereas Glass Wings is more about actually doing it. So um, I just wanted to um, briefly say that um, uh, Xanadu itself does parallel um, Doug's vision quite a lot. Um, Ted's vision um, is really more about um, enhancing the, um, the capabilities of the individual. Uh, not to say that there's no concept of collaborative work, but that the focus has been more on how can we at least make tools that that uh, better use uh, digital technology, communications and computer technology to enable the, uh, the abilities of the individual to create things. Uh, whereas I see uh, Doug's vision more as how do we enhance collective intelligence. That's what this has all been about. And the two obviously do overlap to a fairly large extent. The same set of tools often benefit both, both goals. Anything that benefits individuals does often have application to, to the group and vice versa. So um, there's certainly been some degree of overlap. Um, and um, as I said, I've not only been affiliated with Xanadu, I've also spent some time tracking other hypermedia projects um, over the last uh, 
uh, at least half decade, probably longer. Um, so um, uh, I'll just give a quick um, uh, bit of information with some URLs that are useful. The Xanadu project itself um, information is at xanadu.net um, and uh, that started out as a kind of a monolithic project um, because when Xanadu started in the 1960s um, there really was no, uh, no internet, no um, uh, open community of, uh, there, there really wasn't any shareware or any open source as we now know it, even though you know, the, the standard in the early days was to share the source code, there really was no user community um, of a kind that there is today and so the original model for Xanadu was a single project um, and its goal was really to, as I said, uh, enhance the ability of the individual to create and to preserve, also to preserve literature and information and knowledge. Um, so that sounds simple but of course it turned out to be many, multifaceted and very complex indeed and there are a whole lot of different uh, aspects of that that involved many people, um, many very bright people including for example Eric Drexler who was involved in it in the early days for, for quite some period of time and um, there was a period um, between 88 and 92 where in fact um, Xanadu was a uh, research branch of Autodesk and that was in fact proprietary at that point and uh, when we open sourced that code uh, last year at the Monterey Open Source Conference, Mark Miller remarked that um, having had that previously proprietary work that he'd done um, locked up for 10 years and finally having it open source was like getting a big chunk of his brain back because you know, now he could actually um, do other work without having to always worry about uh, how is that going to tread on, on stuff that he was, wasn't allowed to talk about. We could go on a long time about the nature of the things, but yeah, I, well, I think the value here would be is how do we and the, go ahead. That a lot of valuable work there, and Ted's a mm -hmm. real buddy of mine for years. So how how could we sort of merge, right? Integrate exactly. So um, so that sort of went on until '92. Um, then from about '94 uh, onwards, basically, um, we really re-examined it, and rather than treating Xanadu as a monolithic single project, we started to look at were there separable components. And we found that, yes, indeed, there were. There were a whole bunch of different um, technologies, effectively, that would enable the overall vision, and that you could break those up into separate projects, um, and each of those could be separately useful, but if you designed them so that they would all interoperate, then you would be able to reconstruct the overall vision. And so a lot of those components are now being done as open source projects um, uh, in various ways in conjunction with other research groups, in conjunction with universities. For example, the CRIT project, which has been mentioned a couple of times, was envisioned as um, an answer to how to do the annotation part of the Xanadu vision. Um, and uh, so for the last few years, um, really, Xanadu has been working on um, advancing each of the separate um, uh, technologies uh, and uh, in such a way that you can plug them together. And I think that fits right into the idea of the open hyper document system. I really buy that, but the people that have developed things for coming on here, we've got to give them the space. But right. It's, it's sort of the big thing, can you sort of say, how we could get in touch, where are the URLs, where's the community dialogue, et cetera. Exactly. Like start well, as I said, um, the, the homepage is anna.net. Um, there is also um, two other things that are particularly relevant. Um, one of them is that uh, there's historical stuff and mailing lists and so forth uh, reachable from there, um, which at the moment, uh, for lack of anyone else, I'm running at xanadu.com.au. That is linked to the other page anyway. So if, if, if we go to xanadu.com.au, uh, we can find out. And then, and will you set up something special for people here to sort of answer the questions? I could certainly do that. Um, there are already mailing lists that are also, also visible on the web, but uh, I can always create more mailing lists. So we can provide you with uh, one of our mailing list entries in which you could put some URLs that would be Absolutely. And the, the last uh, uh, thing that's relevant is that there is a separate project of Ted Nelson's which um, is not directly associated with Xanadu um, called ZigZag, which is about um, uh, creating a kind of a structure model that's useful for manipulating knowledge in small chunks and uh, constructing and visualizing that, uh, which I really haven't got time to go into now. Um, but uh, we found that that could potentially also be used for some of our Xanadu related goals. It could also be useful for some of the, uh, uh, of the bootstrap goals. Um, so that's worth looking at as well. Um, the yeah, we have to. I'll just give the, the two URLs for that. Um, the original demonstration of that, which is in Perl, is available at xanadu.net slash zigzag. 
There is now a oh, new invitation in Java it. at gzigzag.sourceforge.net. Really, that's, that does it. <laughs> but, but, thank you. But I, I don't want to be impolite, but, but somehow what we need you to do is provide us with the links. And right. uh, you've been stimulated and stuff. Zigzag is a fascinating sort of gadget. Ted and stuff, they've been working on it for years. It'd be important to integrate it. So the process is how do we, how do we, let's see, what is it? So it's like some, some place there was a statement about, uh, you know, heretic, rebel, a thing to flout. You know, my enemies came up and were shouting me out. But Love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle and took them in, see? So this, I'm not speaking all that about like that, but that's what this, this thing would have to learn how to do is draw the circles and start integrating and, uh, you know, we've got a purpose and it's going to, only way it'd work is by integrating lots of kinds of capabilities out there. So, thank you, Andrew. Um, <clears throat> so, Andrew, sh <laughs> Adam Chire was going to come and talk for a few minutes about his stuff too, and then we've got another speaker that's been preparing for talking about his thing. And so, the, uh, this, was, this was Adam's slide. And he, is, he didn't sneak in here, did he? <laughs> no. So I think a good thing to do would be, you know, the next speaker here is, is Eric Armstrong. And what I'd like to see is Eric come up here and he could comment some upon this. And then he's taking off on his own slides and we can find those as soon as you've said something about this, all right? Meet Eric Armstrong. This was the. Do, do you want to just make sure that they see who you are and you tell them a bit? And you, you know. I can go back. <laughs> um, yeah, first I'd like to say thanks for the opportunity to talk here because this is a really high power group and it's uh, quite a thrill to be part of it. The, uh, I can't, really can't think of anything more compelling to work on, anything more important to spend time on. and. Uh, uh, my employer if I <laughs> might have something to say about that in the near future. Um, but I have been blessed with the opportunity to, to spend a lot of time on these projects. Uh, when I got into computers to start with, it was to augment human intelligence to solve complex problems. So the fact that Doug has been spending so much time and got so much talent on the problem for so long is just <laughs> thrilling. Um, this was the electrifying slide that Adam put up last week. And what he did was to summarize and constrain the problem down to dimensions that are attackable, they're feasible. Um, this line here where he just says, you know, the documents we want to be able to manage are email, HTML, augment, and source code. Nicely constrains a problem that we can attack with an open hypertext system. Um, and it is, it's elegant in its simplicity. And I can assure you that nothing you hear in the next 20 minutes is going to approach that level of, of conciseness. The, uh, we need to be able to publish with version control. We need to be able to look at it in different ways, the same way we can in an augment system. We need a, a simple editor. Um, his, his main concept was there, we absolutely need to be able to look at it in HTML so that it's open, but that we may need to come up with a proprietary editor in order to be able to do um, manipulations of that data, at least at the outset. Uh, he looked at options for publishing. He looked at different ways to views. Um, the main concept being, let's use open hypertext system as a... Uh, <coughs> would you use open hyperdocument, please? Open hyper, okay. They're oh. a whole knowledge container, not just the text. Okay. And, and there's already another project for open hypertext system that's already... Oh, we have OHS here. Sorry. <laughs> okay. It's okay. It's so... Great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm confused. Um, if you have the open hypertext document system, then that's the first step in creating a larger knowledge repository. Um, there's a lot of things that are not being addressed here. We're not looking at knowledge management. We're not looking at uh, uh, model building systems or abstract knowledge systems or expert systems. And that's important because the tools we need to build those systems are, at the very minimum, this system. This makes it perfect for bootstrapping. So, let's see. I guess I need to move on to my slide now. So I apologize for this. Um, I don't. Oh, I wonder. <laughs> OK. 
Okay, now I'm suggesting that our initial target for a system that, uh, a bootstrapping system, should be aimed at improving open source efforts. Um, it dovetails nicely with what Adam is suggesting as a, a starting point. We need to integrate email, web, source code, and the augment system. And it is true bootstrapping because the system we designed to do this will provide a positive feedback loop of bootstrap so that what we start for version one will help us to evolve version two, uh, will help us to evolve the knowledge management and other systems that make sense. Now the two areas where we see a lot of output that can be generated back in are management, um, organizational things, everything about open hypertext system and the information <laughs> management system itself. So <laughs> hyper document system. I'll do that. Just keep correcting me. I do learn. Um, that I lost my train of thought there. That that feedback loop will get us to where we can start building um, the knowledge management systems, the expert systems, uh, take account what people have learned and, and build it up. So it gives us a concrete problem we can focus our thinking on, um, and it gives us a familiar problem domain. Now there's a, a danger there that the first system might be too overly limited. We might be only looking at our own kinds of problems and not the other problems we need to address. But it gives us a tool that we can use to build the next system. Uh, what it needs to do, it needs to track the discussions and the documents we do for requirements, functional specs. Um, I think most of the people here are conversant with software. So I'm not going to go over the, each of these documents, but these are the traditional documents you see in the life cycle of a software system. Um, one thing that's really nice about open source is that your development plans can be event-driven rather than time-driven. Instead of having to march to a time clock to reach some production goal to, so your marketing people know what they're doing, you can say, when it's ready, we ship it. And that's an advantage, and it's an advantage that isn't shared in the commercial marketplace. Um, now, design decisions, I, I really want to emphasize the importance of being able to track design decisions. Um, at one point, I kept a, a design document as I was going along. The alternatives I considered, why I rejected them, which ones I selected, and why. I found myself in a meeting at one point, and they were saying that uh, we ought to do something differently. I was able to take out of that document and say, no, we shouldn't, and here's the reasons. Well, in another meeting, when I was attacked on a point, uh, I took out my document and said, here's the assumptions I had when I made that decision. And it turns out the assumptions were wrong. And I could make the change. But the important thing was that I was sitting there in this meeting three months after making that decision, and I couldn't remember the reason why I made it, but I knew there was some reason. And I was very afraid to make that change because I had no idea what kind of thoughts had gone through my mind, what I was going to run into if I made it. Um, so it told me that it was okay to change, and I had a list of alternatives sitting right there. Now, if we put this kind of system together, we'll have interactive, interactive collaboration. Uh, we'll be able to do versioning and attribution. It's nice to look at a piece of source of code like uh, Doug mentioned and say, who did that? And as we're looking on the email list, we see a lot of rambling discussions, which are very important. They um, introduce a lot of knowledge, but it's important to reduce that at some point into the next version of the document. So the system needs to be able to do that. Um, you also get, and I'm assuming XML here, because I frankly don't see anything else on the horizon that, um, that will come close to being possible to, to, to do it, but I'll leave the design space open and just use XML as an example. There may be a better alternative sometime in the next 20 years, and when we see it, we should do it. Um, we have also some benefits of storing source code in XML that you can't get any other way, and I want to touch on those. The main thing with linking is being able to connect your documents and connect the reasons for making a decision with the results of that decision. Um, at each point, you wind up at the bottom with code and moving backwards through it. Unlike Doug, I do flap. The uh, hardest question to answer when you're looking at a piece of source code is, why was that done? And the hardest thing to document in any short, succinct way is why that was done. Uh, if you're looking, starting at the bottom, at even a simple bug, um, it can take a long explanation to, to explain the changes. Um, 
starting with your design decisions, your development checklists, um, and the various code you put out. The first version of a piece of code is typically very simple. You put out a bunch of things you want to do, a bunch of short explanations, and it reads, it flows, it's really nice. And then you start testing, and your users start giving you feedback, and you start running into problems. And pretty soon, if you're documenting, the code becomes completely unfollowable, the thread of it is completely lost, and if you're uh, not documenting, you wind up with mystery code that no one understands why it's there, and it becomes completely unmaintainable. And the kind of system we're envisioning here can solve most of those problems. Linking is one real good reason. Um, with sync, with you minimize the number of code intrusions. You can put the code in, put a link to the explanation. You put the code in, put a link to the document design decision. Now you have very small amounts of uh, documentation in line. Um, it's possible to make sense of reading it. You reuse the explanation in multiple places. If it takes a page to explain a one-line insertion, which I've done, and it needs to be explained multiple different places, why is this variable here? Why did you store information there? Why did you act on it? That explanation can be reused in multiple places, and linking gives you that capability. Now, we're used to using plain text systems. I mean, that's practically Stone Age. It's we, in, in some ways, given the, everything we've seen about hypertext, we might as well be doing binary code. There's a lot of advantages to hypertext we're not taking advantage of. Um, when you put source into a hierarchical system like XML, one of the things you get is a virtual reduction in size. Your code, instead of looking like one monolith of directories, if you remember the days of uh, linear directories, just one big long list of, direct, of file after file after file, they were very large. I've got maybe 20, 30 directories on my system, and I go into them when I need to get something done, and the other day we had to put it in Outlook, and um, Outlook kept telling me how many folders it was searching. There was 1,500 directories in my system. I had no idea it was that big. To me, it's a 20 directory system, and when I change my context, there's another 10 or 20 things to look at, and at each step, it's very simple. Um, another benefit is rapidly being able to move things. Um, hierarchical systems are unique because they are constrained. There is information in the document about where a structure starts and where it ends. That means every entry is a handle, and you can move a method or a routine by grabbing the handle and dragging it the same way you would in a directory system. Um, literate programming style, your code can look like a series of comments. You're not actually doing literate programming the way Knuth describes it, but what you're looking at is, can be a series of comments where tucked under the co each comment is a piece of code. Um, and there's also the option of eliminating structural syntax and some of the problems that is attendant on those. Now here's an example of literate programming style. Imagine this is a program viewed at the top level. These are the steps that uh, I would conceive as something that could operate as a servlet that would be a front end to augment and let you interact with it as a hypertext system. Now there's going to be a lot of code inside of each one of those sections. But when you collapse the document and look at it, you can see what the thread of that code is. So you've taken out some of the problem with reading, getting a flow of the code by adding links to, to major sections, major, major comments. You've also are gaining it by being able to collapse in a hierarchy. <coughs> now again, it's possible to eliminate structural syntax. Um, we started a I'll uh, give you an URL here. I just forgot to put it in the slide. Um, it's extende dot sourceforge.com. And we're having major trouble getting anything. We finally got the mailing list set up. Uh, we don't have a web page set up yet. I will uh, send out an email with the, um, the addresses. But we are started doing some thinking about what it is like if you start putting source code in a structural system. Um, because the end of the structure is well defined, a compiler or a translator can look at this and it knows where to put the braces. You don't have to put them in yourself. Well, comments. If I've got a slash slash at the beginning, and the end of that known is well defined, I don't have to put a slash slash on the beginning of every line. The compiler is perfectly capable of figuring out where that line ends. And if I have a block comment, 
Again, everything under that is constrained, so if I do that slash star, then the, the star slash that ends the comment can be automatically supplied, and that means I can comment out an entire block of code. Now, in a plain text system, this is impossible because that second comment down there, when it sees the ending star slash, terminates the first comment, and everything that follows underneath that is, tries to be compiled. In a hierarchical system, it's not a problem, and I can put that code in or out by changing a single character. Now, one of the things you see if you program at any time is there is a brace missing somewhere in your program. Be a good guy and go find it, will you? And if you've made a lot of changes, um, it can be really hard finding them. Uh, that goes away. If you, another thing is the impedance mismatch between what the compiler sees and what you see. Uh, the indentation suggests to you containment, but what the compiler sees is something completely different, and you can spend hours trying to find those kind of bugs. Because we think like people fundamentally, and programming, learning to program is, is fundamentally learning to think like a computer so you can see the mistakes it sees. Okay, so what do we need to be able to do source in XML? Well, one thing we need is a filter that will take existing plain text programs and put them into XML structures. Um, one of the nice things about the uh, SANS architecture that Dave Brownell put together is that if you take an existing parser or anything, any parser in fact, that uh, recognizes a data set <coughs> and have it generate SACS events, which is one of the XML protocols, you can plug that into a parser that will um, generate out XML out the other end. So that one is fairly easy to do given someone that has a parser and knows how to use it. <laughs> uh, <coughs> the uh, second part is uh, XML to plain text. Now the interesting thing there is that we have to store the line numbers when we do that because when the compiler gives line number errors, I actually did this by the way, when I started that company to develop an outliner, um, I wrote a little plain text filter and used it to do source code programming. So the examples I'm giving here come from experience. And the one problem with using the system was that when the compiler gave me a line number, I had a hard time finding it in my, in my outline. Um, so, but in XML we have attributes and we can adjust those attributes as we produce plain text. And you know, obviously you need an XML editor, but my claim is that XML is approaching a level of ubiquity that will make XML editors the standard much as plain text editors is today. I think there's a long way to go before that happens, but there's a lot of editor projects in the works. It's so much easier to program with XML because it's well formed that we've, it took us five years to see even one HTML differencing utility. Uh, there's five or six already in the works for XML. It's just that, that good a standard. Um, and we'll need a go-to line number function to be able to translate the exceptions we see in the uh, compiler errors. But eventually, there's no reason not to have XML aware compilers. They can process the XML di directly. Uh, we get rid of the filter, and then the error listings can have links that go directly to it. So you click on the link, just go straight to the line, one less step. Uh, you still have runtime exceptions, but there's no reason that a, the class structure can't store uh, an URL instead of a line number and do the same thing. Now, those I think are basic functionalities. And as we start thinking about version two, I think integrating, I mean, one of the issues that I still have is, is how do you integrate an IBIS style uh, design discussion that Dick Karpinski was nice enough to appoint us to. Um, this is where you have a question, uh, alternative design possibilities, um, pros, cons, uh, an endorsement, I like this idea, and then finally decision, this is the one we decided to do, those are the QAPCED. Um, and one of the questions we have to ask is what does it mean to integrate that kind of an ongoing design decision, because it's fundamentally this kind of structure that records those design decisions. Here's the alternatives we considered, here's the reasons we liked it, here's the reason we didn't, here's the decision we made. Um, and we can also look towards possibly doing a patterns repository. Gamma and the Gang of Four did this wonderful uh, book on patterns, but it's all, here's a pattern, here's how it works, here's a pattern, here's how it works, and those are all great, but it's hard to use them. What pattern do I need right now? I don't know. Unless I know all the patterns, I can't tell which one I want to use. So to invert that structure, 
in a way that says, you know, maybe it's a fact, maybe it's a listing of here's problems that you can solve. And as I go through that series of problems, I look for ones that, that ring a bell, that relate to the issues I'm facing. And I can go to the repository, see that pattern, and find some good way to learn how it works, something interactive. Um, and that moves us towards the kinds of knowledge systems we need to do management structures, that we need to do um, the other organizational thinking. We, we have to kind of close. Oh, we do? Oh. <laughs> as we go off the air, and I need to okay. two minutes to close. Okay. Um, two different approaches. I'm just going to put them up here. I'll put them on the uh, email list. We can use augment front end. Main constraint there is that it's not open to everyone. We can use a new open system that makes it usable by everyone. Um, all the open source efforts. And uh, it's going to be a lot easier with the tools we have today than it was initially. Okay. Summary. Take an initial focus of email, web, source, and augment. It's a true bootstrapping project, it's a familiar project domain. It's a concrete problem to attack, and it will lead us to the next series of things we need to do. And thank you, Doug, for giving oh, me answer. Please. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> no, it's, it's very stimulating to, to, uh, to listen to that, because uh, I was just realizing it was over 30 years ago we moved all our source code onto uh, hyperlinkage stuff. And uh, a lot of things he mentions are things we learned we needed to do and found ways to do it. And so it really kind of provides for me a, a challenge about uh, how, to, how can we sometimes just sort of show the way a lot of those things work together. And as you start uh, accruing them, you find you have to start getting some generalized principles about how it's going to work so that each, each individual trick you can do isn't just a special case. So, uh, we're, you know, somehow we have to find a way to do that. And you guys might all be s saved here by, uh, by technical difficulties. No, it's sort of by uh, my inadequacy of moving around in this space. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could say, okay, you guys fix it. And uh, the, uh, okay. Um, I still would like to just, that tangles up my mouse. Um, so, Thank you, Eric. That was great. And uh, somebody we ought to sometime describe more about all the things he's done, the books he's written, etc. And uh, so one of the things we know that are going to be involved a, a lot of communities that are going to be involved. So and the functions you have to do. So these are all basic kind of functions that that in our DKR we've been isolating and, and listing. And so the the sort of very intriguing thing is to do is to do that sort of thing in the source code software development where we're trying to be as general and basic about the way the repositories work, about the linking, the backlinking, about the attribution, about bringing in Ibis and its successor, Gibbous, etc. in there, and uh, then how to integrate the stuff that uh, the Xanadu offers, and many other people have come up with them like that, but in a way in which they're focused on there. And the open source thing where you're saying, look, let's really try to get in and augment, you know, boost the capability of the source software guys doing their work, that one of the knowledge domains you're interested in is the source code. Great. So it should have its special capabilities for Im embedding the properties you want, but they still should be as general as you possible can and so people can come in. And so people that aren't all skilled in that can come and look with a simple form of an interface, sort of like that. So that, and so there's sort of a model like this, that you've got a, communities out there that are trying to boost their capability, evolution capabilities, and involving in that are all the methods, processes, procedures, customs, governance, techniques, and everything else that the evolutionary human system, and they're busy at developing, integrating, applying the open source tools which also involves the OH standard document structure, which we've been assuming would be XML, and that you get the community's dynamic knowledge base out of that. So 
This is just the model we'd like to have in mind as we get all this started. So Eric's list of nice thoughts and such, it'd be very interesting. I get really intrigued at saying, oh, this is how we do that with Augment, etc. But Augment, does its code structure and everything else is totally out of date, but the capabilities in there are something to just show people. And what I really like is some way in which we actually can demonstrate thoughts in here, or else have some special sessions where we demonstrate and we don't try to webcast it or some way in which we do that. So, uh, so anyway, the, uh, there are a lot of things I learned about why we've got to have interoperability and I don't want to detail that too much. And standards, that, that the standards for the unambiguous description, naming and use of the properties of our knowledge containers. So this is where the XML world, and so we're going to get a real lecture by John Bozak sometime, is that right? Wake up John and tell us. <laughs> And then the unambiguous description also, naming and usage of the functions of, of the tools. Ha ha. Mistake. Should be our tools. Uh, anyway, the, the, uh, those are all parts of what a DKR should really provide for us. So it's been an exciting sort of thing. And I think uh, uh, just a few little things to tailor with is the term, the vocabulary issue comes up for me all through the years in that that developing a common, evolving vocabulary is something society, open society does, and it sort of evolves. So this is what we need to do, is the terms, the processes, the conventions people are going to use when they do some of this backlink management and attribution support needs conventions, need the customs, the terminology, the language we use, all that needs to evolve. And there's just absolutely no way it could evolve with a proprietary push underneath it. So the open source, open hyper document, open community for evolving, the whole stuff is just what we have to have. So I think with that, either, either though I may have more slides here, I think it's time to close because I think our, our, our whole 90 minutes has run out. So thank you very much. We'll see you next week. <laughs> oh. last, last week, Eric led us down the street to a place where there's quite a bit of room and students aren't around very much and you can get pizza and we sat around and talked. So stay around and talk a while now but not beyond the patience of the people who are staying and watching the place and then whoever would like to go, come along. Thank you.